Well, good morning, a uh, warm welcome to our service. It's good to see you here today. Uh, just let me give you the announcements. Uh, we meet again for prayer this evening at 6.30 in the Nelson Room before service of worship at 7 o'clock. Uh, so do come back again this evening to worship the Lord. Uh, then on Wednesday night at 7.45, we have our, our pre-communion service. So not the normal midweek uh, prayer meeting, but our pre-communion service to prepare for uh, communion. And, and communion will be served uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, as part of the service. Uh, there'll be a songs of praise meeting after the evening service next Sunday. Some members uh, of the church will introduce songs for us to sing together. So uh, bear that in mind as you come next week. Uh, but uh, the Presbytery of North Belfast organizes joint services from time to time. And the next one is on Sunday, the 23rd of June. That's next Sunday at 7 p.m. in Seaview Presbyterian Church. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can go along to Seaview uh, instead of uh, coming here uh, there'll be a focus on the work of Grace and Hope at Carla Circus and Central Church in the city center. Uh, perhaps you'd let me know if uh, you'll be part of a mission team this summer so that uh, the congregation can pray for you. So just uh, have a word with me uh, after the service and uh, we can uh, note down the details. Please pray for the ministers and elders who'll be attending the General Assembly, which meets this week from Thursday to Saturday. Uh, normally the General Assembly is at the beginning of June, they've decided to move it to uh, later in June, uh, and it's usually Monday to Friday or Saturday, but they're having it on Thursday to Saturday, so a number of changes, uh, so do pray for the ministers and elders as they discuss issues in relation to the church, the, the whole denomination, and make decisions, uh, so do pray for that. Uh, there's still some lost property uh, down at the Baird Hall, so do take a look at it. Uh, a lot of it's stuff that was left over from catering events, so you've got plates and uh, 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 containers and things like that. Uh, so do take a look at that and take it away if it belongs to you. And there's also, there's also some glasses, you know, spectacles there. Uh, so if you're missing your glasses, you might find them down there. So do take a look uh, after the service. And uh, those are all the announcements I have. Joanna, though, is going to come and speak to us about fresh. morning everyone um, just a quick announcement about fresh this year um, so fresh is going to be from the 19th to the 23rd of august um, so you can note that in your diary um, and then our family fun day will be on saturday the 24th um, so fresh is going to run very similar to what it has done in the past we'll have um, kids down from half six to eight and then the teenagers um, from eight to half nine and um, with the kids this year we're going for an olympics theme um, and we'll be following um, a book called Champions, and it sort of is looking at stories about Jesus, attributes of um, him and of a follower of him. And then with the teenagers, similar again, a bit more of a relaxed vibe and having um, a talk from one of the leaders and then a bit of um, time for discussion. Um, so I have a few requests. Um, firstly, um, I would ask for prayer um, for Fresh. Um, so for the organization of it all, and for all those who will be involved, for the kids and the young people that will come down, and just that God would really bless that week. Um, and then secondly, um, we would ask for your help. Um, so last year we had about 110 children on average, and about 30 to 40 teenagers um, each evening, which was amazing. Um, but we had a very small team, um, roughly about 10 to 15 max um, of people from the traditional fresh team. Um, so as you can imagine, um, imagine that was a bit of a challenge 
um, if it hadn't been for people um, staying after helping with registration or being asked to come down to give a hand, um, we just wouldn't have been able to manage um, and do what we needed to do. So, um, so looking for fresh going forward, that's not something that um, we want to be happening again this year. Um, so we see that as an, a time for a bit of opportunity for change. Um, and so what we would love is that, um, what we would love and what we would need is that fresh becomes something um, that everyone from the congregation can get involved in. Um, our young people are amazing and they're so good at it. Um, but we just need um, more numbers um, to be able to do what we want to do in the summer. Um, so no matter what age you are, um, as long as you're over 16, <laughs> um, we would love for you um, to join us in the Fresh team this year. Um, we're not asking you to sign up to commit to every evening. Um, I'm not going to ask you to do a story from the front or lead from the front if you don't want to. Um, but there's a job for everybody to do. Um, and we would really love and appreciate if as many people from the church family um, could get involved in that. It's such a great um, opportunity to reach out to our community. Um, and so the more people involved, um, the better. Um, so if it's something, um, after thinking about it, praying about it, that you would like to be involved in, um, we're going to have a fresh meeting in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I'll um, find a date for that. I'm not that organized yet. Um, um, so you can come along and find out a bit more about it if you'd like to. Or if you have any questions, please just ask. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Joanna. Uh, we're here to worship God in Psalm 111. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Well, let's uh, give thanks to the Lord. Let's stand together to sing that psalm, Psalm 111, praise to the Lord.
let's turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. And we come to you, Almighty God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, and by your Spirit, and we come to worship you. We worship you because all your works are great and glorious and majestic. In the beginning, you made the heavens and the earth and all that they contain, and it was all very good. And day after day, you uphold all that you have made, sustaining all things by your mighty power. And wherever we look on the earth, we see the evidence of your kindness to us because you're the one who provides us with all that we need. We worship you because you've sent redemption for us when you sent your only begotten son into the world as one of us and to free us from our sin and misery in this life and to give us peace with you forever and to give us a hope of everlasting life in your presence. And we worship you because you give us wisdom and insight and understanding about how to live a good life in this world while we wait for Christ our Savior to come again. And so we worship you to get today and with the psalmist we declare that you deserve eternal praise. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your presence this morning, we pray that you'll help us to worship you Help us to give thanks to you in our prayers and our praise and help us to pay attention to the reading and preaching of your word. We pray that we would receive your truth with faith and humility. And will you build us up in our faith and in our love for one another? Will you fill us with zeal for the glory of your name so that we will make it our aim to please you in all that we do? And we ask all of these things in our Savior's name. Amen. If you've got a Bible, please uh, turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Um, we were reading through the book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings. We finished that uh, recently, so I thought we'd turn to uh, Proverbs. And uh, you'll see most of these are the Proverbs of uh, Solomon. God gave Solomon a lot of wisdom, and so we have these Proverbs, these wise sayings. And uh, at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, we've got a challenge. Will we follow wisdom or will we follow folly? And really, uh, following wisdom means following the Lord, worshiping him, uh, walking in his ways. Uh, following uh, folly means going after false gods and idols, uh, turning our backs on God. Uh, just this morning, we're going to read verses 1 to 19 of chapter 1. So this is the word of the Lord. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, Let's lie in wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we will share a common purse. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net in full view of all the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They waylay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. Amen. We'll end the reading there. And we thank God for his word to us this morning. Let's uh, turn to God to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. 
blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly from all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and how from our childhood until this very day we have sinned against your law by our sinful thoughts and words and desires and deeds which are too many to count. Heavenly Father, you've called us to be your holy people and to walk in your ways and to do your will here on earth. But we confess that far too often we're just like those who do not believe. And we go astray from your ways and we fall short of doing your will. We're meant to display the fruit of your spirit in our lives. But we confess that far too often we only display the works of the flesh. We're meant to live our lives for Christ who died for sinners and was raised. But far too often we live only for ourselves. We're meant to offer ourselves to you as instruments of righteousness, but we confess that far too often we offer ourselves to sin as instruments of wickedness. We're meant to count ourselves dead to sin and alive to you, but instead we let sin reign in us and we obey its evil desires. We're meant to be wise and to know how to live good lives. But instead, we're often foolish and we go astray. Heavenly Father, we're sorry. We're sorry for all the ways we have fallen short of doing your will and for all the ways that we dishonor you. But we pray that you'll not deal with us according to your iniquities. Instead, will you deal with us according to your mercy? And will you forgive us for the sake of Christ our Savior who gave up his life as the ransom to set us free from condemnation. And so for his sake, will you forgive us and cleanse us? And will you give to all who trust in your son the assurance of sins forgiven and the hope of everlasting life in your presence? We ask too that your spirit will work in our lives more and more to help us to offer ourselves to you uh, to do what is good and right and pleasing in your sight. We ask that the fruit of your spirit will be seen in us and that will bring glory to you by what we do and say. Help us to live a life here on earth that reflects the glory of heaven above and enable us to walk in your ways while we wait for our Savior to come again. And we ask all of these things through Christ our, our Savior. Amen. And having confessed our sins, hear the good news from Jeremiah 33, where God says, I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me invite the boys and girls to come up to the front now. Okay, good to see you. <coughs> good to see you. Um, yeah, grab a seat. Um, so we've been thinking about Abraham uh, the, for the last uh, few weeks. Uh, so Abraham, and do you remember, God appeared to him when he was living with his family, and God appeared to him and said, leave your, your family's home and go uh, uh, to the place where God was going to show him, God was going to bring him to the promised land, and he was going to give it to him. And God also said, I'm going to make you, uh, you, you like a, a great nation. You're going to be like the stars in the sky, too many to count. You're going to have so many descendants, so many people are going to come from you. It's going to be like a great nation. Uh, and then, uh, do you remember, of course, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they got very old and they hadn't had any children at all. But then wonderfully, uh, God uh, enabled them to have a child of their own. They named him Isaac. And last week, we were thinking about how God told them to, to uh, sacrifice Isaac Uh, but just at the end, God said, stop, stop, don't go any further, and so Isaac was spared. Well, Abraham is a really, really old man now, and Sarah, in fact, has died, his wife has died, she's buried in that uh, cave there, that tomb, so Abraham has got really old, and uh, in this picture, it's just a reminder about how God had promised to give them lots and lots and lots of descendants, so this great nation would come from them, so see all these people, there's God was saying, all of these people, they'll come from you, They'll come from you, they'll come from Isaac, your son, and they'll spread throughout the world. Uh, So that's what God had promised, and uh, they had their one son, Isaac. We saw him last week when he was only a boy, but now he's a man, he's a young man, and uh, Isaac needs a wife, 
Isaac needs a wife, somebody to marry so that he too can have children, and they can have children, they can have children, they can have children, so there'll be this great big nation coming from them. So where would he get a wife from? Well, uh, Abraham was worried because he looked around where they were living. They were living in the promised land, but all the people around them didn't believe in God. They were worshiping false gods and idols, you know, lumps of stone. They didn't believe in the true God. And Abraham didn't want Isaac to marry one of them, one of those people who didn't believe in God. So he wanted uh, uh, Isaac to marry one of the people from his hometown where they believed in God and worshiped him. And so, Abraham called then his servant, and he said, listen, I, I want you to go and find a wife for my son Isaac, but uh, promise me you won't get him a wife from around here, because none of the people around here believe in God. Uh, promise me that you'll go way back to where we came from. You'll go to my people where they worship God, and you'll find a wife for my son uh, over there. Uh, and he said, listen as well, will you promise, don't take my son Isaac away from here because God's given us this land. It's going to be ours, so he mustn't leave it. And the servant listened to Abraham and said, I promise, I'll promise, I'll find a wife for your son, and uh, I'll f I won't choose one of the, the women from around here. I'll go back to your family home and find somebody there who believes in God, and uh, I'll bring the woman here so that Isaac doesn't have to go to her and leave the promised land. So he set off, and he went on a long journey from uh, this place, Hebron, that was in the Promised Land, and he went far away up into the north, uh, back to where Abraham's family were, uh, where they still believed in the Lord God. It was a long way, uh, it took a while to get there, but eventually arrived, uh, and he had gone with ten camels, which were loaded up with presents. And when he arrived at the, at the place, he, he, uh, he stopped at a pool for water, and uh, he prayed to God because he thought, What's, what am I going to do now? So he prayed to God and he says, here I am, God, I'm at this pool with water. You know, women will come here with their, their jars to, to draw water. Uh, and, he, and he prayed to God and said, listen, uh, God, let the, the, I'm going I'm to say to a woman who comes here, uh, give me a drink. And if she agrees to give me a drink, and then if she offers to and to water my camels as well. Let that be the one, the one who's going to marry uh, Isaac, uh, my master's son. So he prayed to God for, for guidance, for help. And uh, soon after he prayed, and this woman, oh, there he is praying. Soon after he prayed, this woman, Rebecca, appeared, and she's got a jar. She's come to fill up her jar with water to bring it back home. And whenever the servant saw her, he said to her, uh, well, will you give me a drink? And she said, yes, I'll give you a drink. And she poured some uh, water uh, out of the well for him, and he drank it. And after he'd finished drinking it, he sa she said, listen, I'll water your camels too. That's what he prayed for. That was a sign he prayed for, that the woman would offer to uh, water the camels as well, because that was going to be a big job. And she offered. Well, uh, this, the, the, uh, the uh, servant was delighted when he heard this because he thought, this must be the one. And he spoke to her. Oh, there she's drinking the water. Uh, he spoke to her and he found out who her family was. And he was delighted because she came from a family of believers, people who worship God. And uh, he asked if he could stay the night in their house. And she said that she could. There was plenty of room for him. And she gave him, uh, he gave her some gifts. And uh, she led him home to her house to meet her family, her father and her brother and uh, uh, her mother and uh, the rest of her family. And they all sat down to eat. And whenever they sat down to eat, uh, well, before they ate, he says, I must talk to you. I must tell you why I'm here. And so he explained to Rebecca's father and the rest of the family how Abraham had a son, Isaac, and Isaac needed a wife. And Abraham had asked him to come all this way to find a wife for Isaac among all the believers. And God had promised to bless them, and uh, they all listened to what he had to say, and at the end of his story, they said, yeah, well, we believe this is from the Lord. This is God's will. And so they said, yes, you can take Rebecca to be the wife of Isaac. But they wanted her, I, uh, Rebecca to wait another 10 days, so stick around the house for a chance for us to say goodbye, and we can bring on all the neighbors, they can say goodbye. Don't go immediately. But the this, this servant, he was eager to get home as soon as possible. So they said, well, let's, let's ask Rebecca herself. 
does she want to wait 10 more days or does she want to go straight away? And Rebecca said, no, I'll go straight away. I'm ready to go. Let's go. So the two of them set off on their camels, uh, uh, the servant and Rebecca, and uh, they traveled all the way back to the promised land, back to where Abraham and Isaac were. And uh, when they arrived, well, when they arrived, it must have been love at first sight because uh, Isaac and Rebecca got married and uh, they loved one another. And we'll hear more about what happened to them uh, next week, I think. Well, let me take you back to this slide. Because there, as you remember, uh, God had said to Abraham, listen, you're going to have lots and lots and lots of descendants. Lots of people will come from you. It'll be like a great nation. There'll be so many people coming from you. It'll be like the stars in the sky, too many to count. And, and that happened because uh, Abraham and Sarah, they had a son Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah, they had two children, uh, Jacob and Esau. And then from them, there came a whole nation, all the people of Israel. And uh, from them came the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was descended from Abraham, and he was descended from Isaac, and he was descended from Jacob. So it was uh, vitally important for Isaac to find a wife. Because when he found a wife, it started uh, this line that we'd end up with the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, coming into the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the way that you guided that servant all the way to the right place to find the right person to marry Isaac. And we thank you, Lord God, that from Isaac there came the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we think of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he loved us. And he left the glory of heaven, came all the way down to earth in order to save us from our sins and to give us eternal life. And so, Lord God, help us always to believe in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to, and to trust in you for all that we need day by day. We pray that you'll help the boys and girls as they go into children's church to hear more uh, about uh, Isaac and, uh, and Abraham. And uh, we pray, Lord God, that you'll help the boys and girls uh, throughout the week in all that they do. Uh, help them to honor you in all that they do and say. And we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. Okay, do you want to go back to your seats and we're going to sing our song, which is My God is So Big. Let's pray again. And Heavenly Father, in our prayers of intercession, we pray for the leaders of the nations and we ask that you'll help them to be uh, men and women of integrity uh, so that they uh, do what is good and right and uh, so that they'll shun all that is evil. Will you help them to uphold law and order and to care for the poor and the weak? Will you help them to keep the peace between the nations and within their own nations? 
And we pray for the upcoming general election, and we ask that you will give us good and wise leaders who will govern each part of the United Kingdom well. We pray for all the ministers and elders meeting at the General Assembly this week. Will you help them to conduct their business in a way that is pleasing to you? Will you give them wisdom uh, for all the decisions they have to make? Will you prevent them from making decisions they would later regret? May all things be done for your glory and for the good of your people. Uh, help the outgoing moderator as he returns to his uh, parish ministry. Will you help the new moderator to serve the Presbyterian Church with distinction, bringing honor to Christ our King? We pray that you'll build Christ's church throughout this island, help ministers to be faithful to their calling, to preach your word, help your people to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and to be faithful to you always. We pray that the gospel will be proclaimed throughout this island and that sinners will be convinced by what they hear and converted to a true faith in Christ so that they're added to your church. We pray that you'll help our missionaries as they seek to serve you overseas and to make known the gospel message. Help them to remain faithful to their calling. And will you provide for them and protect them every day? Will you bless their work so that they will have the joy of seeing sinners converted to faith in Christ and their lives transformed by the power of your spirit? And we pray also for one another we pray for our members who are in hospital, uh, asking that they will be restored to full health and strength. We pray for those who are, are recovering at home, and we ask that they will grow stronger every day, and in their adversity, help them to continue to trust in your fatherly care. Will you comfort those who are grieving? Will you give reassurance to any who are anxious? Will you help those who are sitting exams at this time of the year? Will you help us all to remain faithful to Christ our Savior and to walk in your ways all the days of our life? Uh, help us to be united together under Christ. Help us to walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave up his life for us. Lord, will you hear us and will you answer us? For we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. And uh, before we turn again to God's word, let's stand to sing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy.
draws me and my time has come still my soul sing your praise Let's uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 in the uh, New Testament. So after 1 and 2 Corinthians, you've got Galatians and Ephesians. And uh, we're going to read verses 1 to 10 of chapter 1. This is God's word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Amen, and we'll uh, end the reading there. We thank God for it. Let's pray for a moment. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, last week we finished our studies in the books of 1 and 2 Kings uh, when we read about the exile of God's people to Babylon. Uh, and since we spent a long time now in the Old Testament, it's uh, time to return to the, the New Testament. And I've decided to begin a new series of sermons on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, Ephesus was a city in the Roman province of Asia, which is now uh, Turkey. And uh, you can read about the time Paul visited Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 and how he planted a church there. Uh, and that's something so you might like to do this afternoon, read uh, through Acts 19. And as I was preparing for today, it occurred to me that today's passage is actually a good follow-up to last week's passage. And that's because last week's passage was all about God's curses. Uh, God sent the people of Judah away from the promised land and into exile as his curse on them for their persistent un un uh, unbelief and rebellion. Because they'd turned away from the Lord and had done evil in his sight again and again and again, God poured out his covenant curses upon them. That's what the passage we studied last week was, was about. But the passage we're studying today is all about God's blessings. Uh, so if you've got your Bible open, take a look at verse 3, where Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Uh, because of the new and better covenant which God has made with us through his Son, 
we can expect blessings from God and not curses. We can expect good things from the Lord and not evil. Last week's passage was all about God's curses. This week's passage is all about his blessings. Uh, Because we're sinners, all of us, we deserve God's wrath and curse. But because of Christ our Savior, we receive blessings from God, one good thing after another. And since uh, we've not done anything to deserve these good things, then God deserves all the praise and the honor and the glory for giving them to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul begins the letter by telling his readers that this letter is from him, and he describes himself as an apostle of uh, Christ Jesus by the will of God. In other words, he didn't make himself an apostle. Uh, He didn't appoint himself. Uh, God made him an apostle. It was God's will for him to become an apostle. And we know that's the case because the risen Lord Jesus met Paul when he was on the road to Damascus and appointed him to be an apostle. And the apostles, of course, were that small group of men uh, who had been appointed by the Lord as official eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And they'd been sent out by Christ to proclaim the good news of his life and death and resurrection and uh, to declare forgiveness to all who repent and believe. Uh, Most of the apostles had once been the Lord's disciples, and they had heard and seen the things that he said and did during his earthly ministry. After Judas killed himself, uh, Matthias was chosen to replace him, and then the Lord appeared to Paul and converted him so that he became a believer and appointed him as an apostle. And so he was an apostle by the will of God. God chose him for this special work. And Paul addresses his letter to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And uh, the Greek word uh, translated as saints means holy ones. And to be holy means to be set apart, to belong to God. Uh, God sets his people apart from the rest of humanity to belong to him. Uh, He makes us his special people And the word translated faithful can mean faithful. So the saints in Ephesus were faithful to the Lord and not unfaithful. They walked in his ways. Uh, They were devoted to him. Uh, However, the word can also be translated believers. That is to say, they are full of faith. They believe the gospel. And in whom or what do they believe? Well, they believe in Christ Jesus, who is the only savior of the world. And then Paul pronounces a a kind of benediction on his readers. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Grace is God's kindness to us. So he graciously uh, pardons our sins. And he graciously helps us every day. And when Paul mentions peace, he probably has in mind that the Hebrew word shalom, which refers to that general sense of well-being, that sense that all will be well. And that sense that all will be well comes to us from God, our Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is also gracious and kind to us and who forgives our sins and who helps us every day. And so we come then to verses 3 to 10. And in fact, verses 3 to 14 are are one long sentence in, in the Greek text. It's one long sentence But the translators have broken it up to to make it easier for us to to read and to follow the the flow of what Paul is saying to us. One of the commentators suggests that when this letter was originally read to the congregation in Ephesus, so it would have been read out loud to the congregation, uh, the reader would know when to take a breath or when to pause. And by taking a, a breath in the right place, by pausing in the right place, probably where our translators have put a full stop or a comma, he would uh, help the original audience to follow the flow of Paul's thought. And this one long sentence begins with Paul declaring praise to God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And why should God be praised? Well, it's because he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So God has blessed us. He has poured out his blessings on us. He has been good to us. And Paul says that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms. Now, later on in the letter, Paul will say that we have been raised with Christ and have been seated with him in the heavenly realms. So 
that's where we belong now. While we go on living on the earth, we live as citizens of heaven above. That's where we really belong. And as citizens of heaven above, we have been blessed by God with every spiritual blessing. And so what are these spiritual blessings? Well, Paul is about to mention some of them, not, not all of them, but some of them. But before we, we get into them, notice that he says, God blesses us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And so all of these blessings are connected with Christ. It's because of him that they become ours. God the Father is the source of all these good things, and they become ours only because of Christ. Uh, Christ is the, the fountain through whom all these blessings flow down to us. Because he's the one who was appointed from all eternity to be our savior and to make peace for us with God. And from all authority, when God thought about us, he always thought about us in connection with Christ. And Paul emphasizes this for us because throughout the verses, he refers to Christ again and again and again. So take a look at verse 4 if you've got your Bible open. It, he, Paul says, he chose us in him, in Christ. And then there's verse 5, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves, that's Jesus Christ. Verse 7, in him, that's in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, Paul refers to the mystery of God's will which he purposed in Christ. And in verse 10, God's plan is to bring everything together under Christ. So it's all connected with him. God the Father is a source of all of these blessings, all of these good things, and they become ours because of Christ. They flow down to us from God through Christ. Without Christ, we would have none of these good things. And so what are the blessings? Well, as I said, Paul mentions some of them, but not all of them. And the first one Paul mentions is in verse 4, where he says that God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Well, let's start at the end of that. He chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight. Uh, I've already said that to be holy means to be set apart. Christians are God's holy people because we've been set apart from the rest of the world to belong to God. But to be holy also means to, to be set apart from evil, set apart from sin. It refers then to moral purity. And to be blameless means being free from guilt. A, a blameless person is a person who can't be blamed for anything. A blameless person can't be accused of anything. So is that you? Are you holy? Would people say about you that you're morally pure and you never ever sin? Are you blameless? Would people say about you that you've never done anything wrong? Well, none of us are holy and blameless like that. But according to Paul, according to Paul, God has chosen his people to be holy and blameless. That is to say, because of Christ, we will be holy and blameless one day. And that's because one day God will free us from sin and blame completely and forever. It won't happen in this life, but it will happen. It'll happen when Christ comes again to renew us completely in God's image and to bring us into God's presence forever. And when that happens, we'll be morally pure so that we'll never do anything wrong or blameworthy ever again. And until that day comes, God regards us as holy and blameless in his sight because of Christ. So God forgives us for what we've done wrong because of Christ who gave up his life to pay for our sins. And, and Christ shares his perfect goodness with us. He covers us in his perfect goodness so that when God looks at us, he sees the perfect goodness of Christ instead of our sins and shortcomings. So what a blessing. Right now in this life, God regards us as holy and blameless because of Christ. And one day we will become holy and blameless because of Christ. And God chose us for this blessing before the creation of the world. So it wasn't as if he looked at us and saw something good in us or something salvageable. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you hear about a successful business, businessman who chooses to make a young person his prodigy. 
because, you know, the businessman sees something uh, potential in that young person, uh, something that makes this young person stand out from the crowd. Well, does God see something like that in us? Is that why he chose us? He saw some potential in us. Well, what does Paul say? He says he chose us. God chose us before the creation of the world. So he chose us before we existed and before we had done anything at all. And that means he chose us because he's gracious and he chose us because of Christ. Because God is gracious and kind, he chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless in his sight. And then Paul adds that uh, God predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. And the word predestined simply means that when God chooses a person, he has a destiny or a purpose in mind for that purpose. Uh, when he chooses someone, he has a plan for that person. And what is the plan which God has in mind for the people he chooses? Well, it's to be adopted, to become a member of his family. And what a blessing that is. Um, I wonder if you've ever seen that photo. It's quite a famous photo of uh, John F. Kennedy who's sitting in the Oval Office uh, in the White House in Washington and uh, he's reading some papers. And so, of course, he's a president. he was the President of the United States, most important person, most powerful person perhaps in the whole world. And if you've ever watched the, the West Wing or, or similar dramas, you'll know that there are always guards posted at the door of the Oval Office to prevent unauthorized people from going inside. But in the photo, you can see one of the president's children sitting under the desk. Uh, the guards outside have to stop other people from going inside. But when the president's child comes up to the door, it's open to him. And he can go inside to see the president to play at his feet. Because the president is the child's father. And almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the most high God who rules over all, has become our heavenly father. And so we can go to him. Uh, we can go to him in prayer. And when we go to him in prayer, the door is open to us. And we can talk to the most high God about whatever is troubling us. Because he has become our heavenly father. And of course, like all the other blessings, this one becomes ours because of Christ. He is the true son of God. And because of him and through faith in him, we all become sons and daughters of God. If you're a woman, don't be put off by the words adopted as his sons, because adoption doesn't just mean we can go to God in prayer. It also means we become heirs. And uh, normally in Bible times, only sons could become heirs. Only sons could inherit the family form. And so when Paul says we're adopted as sons, he wants us to know that whether you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, you too can receive this blessing you too can be adopted into God's family. You too can become an heir. And what do we inherit from God? Through Christ. Well, we inherit eternal life in the new heavens and earth. And it's available to all, men and women, boys and girls, everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when God chooses us, he had a destiny in mind for us. And that destiny is to adopt us into his family so that we can go to him in prayer and tell him what's troubling us. And we will also inherit eternal life in the new heavens and earth where we'll live with our heavenly father and with Jesus Christ our savior forever and forever. What a blessing. And look now at verse five, or, or look how verse five begins and ends. It begins with love and it ends with God's uh, pleasure and will. So no doubt there have been people uh, who have been adopted reluctantly into your families. You know, no one really wanted these children, but somebody had to take them in. And so some distant relative reluctantly adopted these children. But God doesn't adopt us reluctantly. When he planned it, he did it in love. And it was his good pleasure to do so. It was something he wanted to do. And therefore, it leads to praise, praise to God because of his glorious grace. That's to say, it's all down to his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's all due to his kindness to us. Uh, he chose us to be holy and blameless. It, he chose us to be adopted into his family. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for his kindness to us. And that's not all. According to verse 7, God has also redeemed us in Christ through Christ's blood. 
and that leads to forgiveness. In, in Old Testament times, a, a farmer whose bull got loose and killed someone was guilty of manslaughter if he could have prevented it. Uh, as such, he deserved to die uh, as a penalty for manslaughter. But he could pay a ransom in order to redeem his life. He could pay a price so that his life was spared. So to redeem someone meant paying a ransom in order to spare your life from death. And one of the blessings which God gives to his people is redemption. He redeems us. He spares us because of Christ. You see, we're, we're like the farmer uh, who was under a death sentence. We're like the farmer because the wages of sin is death. What we deserve for all that we do wrong is death. Death is the penalty for what we have done wrong. But one of the blessings God gives to us is that he redeems us. He spares us. He releases us from that penalty. And he releases us from that penalty through the blood of Christ. And when Paul refers to Christ's blood, he's thinking about his death on the cross. Christ gave up his life on the cross as the ransom price to pay for our sins and shortcomings so that our life will be spared. We still die, but death for those who are redeemed is no longer the penalty for our sins. Death is now the doorway into God's presence and to the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore which God has prepared for his redeemed people. Death leads to better life. And so what a blessing, though we deserve to die as punishment for all that we've done wrong, we are now brought into the presence of God to live with him forever and forever. And this too is in accordance with God's grace. It's due to his kindness. He was under no obligation to do this for us, but he willingly and gladly did it for us because he is gracious and kind and good. And the final thing I'll mention today is that God has also blessed us by making known to us the mystery of his will. Do you see that in verse 9? Uh, when Paul uses the word mystery, he's referring to, to something about our salvation which we would never know, never ever know unless God revealed it to us. And so what is the mystery of God's will here? What is this thing which we would never have known unless God made it known? Well, it's his plan to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, Jesus Christ. So when God created the world in the beginning, uh, there was this wonderful richness and, and variety. I've spoken about this before, but he made various kinds of plants, not one kind only. He made all kinds of fish and not one kind only. He made all kinds of birds and not one kind only. He made all kinds of animals and not one kind only. And he didn't make one kind of human being because he made us different. He made us male and female. And not one of us is the same as the other. And we all have different abilities and skills and talents and interests which God has given to us. The heavens and the earth are filled with this wonderful diversity. And yet there's also unity in the diversity because all things came from God. And in that way we reflect the God who made us because God is both one and many. Uh, he is one and diverse. He's one God, but he's also three persons. And he made the world like himself, full of diversity, but also united. But then sin came into the world. And as I've said before, because of sin, difference and diversity becomes opposition. They become divisions. We're divided from God because of our sin. And we're divided from one another so that husbands and wives fight with one another. Children disobey their parents. The rich and the powerful take advantage of the poor and the weak. And the poor and the weak resent the rich and the powerful. Whole countries fight against one another. And when asylum seekers flee one country and come to another, they're met with suspicion and hatred and with graffiti telling them to go home. Later in his letter, Paul will write about spiritual warfare. And how there are spiritual forces of evil who oppose God's people in the world. So God's good creation has been spoiled because of Adam's sin in the beginning and because of our own daily sins. Sin divides us. But God has revealed the mystery of his will and how he plans to bring all things in heaven and earth together again under Christ. He's already at work in the church because in the church he helps us to love one another and to bear with one another and to forgive one another. And when Christ comes again, he'll restore order to the whole universe. 
when every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and all things will be renewed. Those who didn't believe in him in this life will be sent away to be punished and therefore they'll be put in subjection to him and they'll not be able to cause any more trouble in the world. And those who believed in him in this life will be brought into the new heavens and earth where there will be no disorder but only order, no divisions but only unity and peace and joy and happiness. And the whole of God's new creation will fit together perfectly under Christ. So this is the mystery of God's will. If we just looked at the world the way it is now, we would never have thought it was possible or likely. Because everywhere we look, we see sin and misery and division and opposition. But God has revealed it to us that this will certainly happen. This is what he has planned. Christ will be the center of all things and everything else will fit together under him. And it begins now. It begins in the church. Though we're different from one another, we're to love one another, we're to serve one another, we're to join our hearts and and mouths and praise to God for our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what do we praise the Lord our God for? Well, we praise him for blessing us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise you for blessing us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We thank you for pouring out upon us one blessing after another and we thank you too for revealing to us your plan for the world to bring all things together under Christ it seems impossible to us when we look at the world the way it is right now even when we look at our own lives and the disorder in in them but we thank you father for giving us this great hope in Christ Jesus so help us to praise you now and forever and we pray this in our saviour's name amen Let's stand to sing uh, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. go forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.